Welcome everyone, hello. Um, welcome to the fifth lecture of your Triple E3. And in this lecture, we're going to be talking about DC machines and batteries. Okay, so uh, what are DC machines and batteries? Well, basically, uh, they're just an additional an additional uh, circuit element. You can think of it as an additional, additional circuit element aside from your basic voltage source, current source, and, a, and your resistor. And we're going to be uh, talking about them in this lecture. Okay, so the, the objectives of this lecture is basically um, you add, we will add uh, DC generators and DC motors in our circuit analysis. And we'll uh, understand the ratings associated with DC machines. When you see a DC machine, uh, you'll see some ratings on a DC machine. And uh, you'll be able to understand what the ratings mean at all. So, of course, when, when we think of machines, we think of uh, energy conversion. So, uh, you'll see there's an input power, output power, and lost power in these machines. Okay, And uh, we'll relate the speed of rotation of DC machines with its electrical characteristics. Basically, we have mechanical characteristics and electrical characteristics of your DC machines. And finally, um, at the end of the lecture... You look at a uh, we look at a battery uh, use a battery in circuit analysis. Okay, so an outline for this lecture you have four parts actually. So an overview of rotating machines, uh, analysis of your and operation of the machines, some uh, circuit analysis examples, and finally battery and cells. So uh, in this lecture I'll be doing I'll be finishing this whole set of slides. So it will be all four parts. But if you're getting tired, I suggest you stop at the second part. So at the second part, so you won't be saturated with information, but I'll just be uploading one whole lecture in YouTube. All right. So without further ado, let's uh, start our, uh, this is lecture on DC machines. So just a brief overview, uh, a machine or a rotating machine has its mechanical side and its electrical side. Okay. So there's energy flow between uh, these two sides. So energy could flow from here to here, from your electrical to your mechanical side. That is a motor. And energy could flow from your mechanical side to your electrical side. And this is your generator. Okay. So, all right. So, uh, oh, wait, sorry. Let me just change the color correctly. Yeah, there you go. Let's use the orange. All right. So, uh. Where generators basically convert your mechanical energy to electrical energy, and it's driven by what we call a prime mover. All right, so a prime mover. So it could be a steam, wind turbine, a gas engine, a falling and running water. So basically, uh, you see this uh, in power plants where they generate electricity. They have a lot of generators that generate electricity and bring it to your home. Okay, motors, on the other hand, uh, use electrical energy to uh, to uh, make something rotate or make something move. And uh, basically, your electrical energy is converted to mechanical energy in motors. So um, it has uh, electric power and it uh, since uh, using electric power, it develops torque. All right. So some applications of DC machines, uh, we have, of course, your toys like this, uh, the, fam the famous brand Tamiya. Okay. So your famous uh, Japanese brand of uh, toy cars and um, others so it would be your robotic arms, disc drives. They use DC motors, all right? So uh, portable systems and off-grid systems like your e-vehicles, uh, these vehicles run on electricity. Okay, so, all right. So um, the construction or the basic, uh, basic, structure of your DC machine composed is composed of a stator and a rotor. Okay, so the stator is basically the uh, element of the machine that produces a magnetic field that is static. Okay, so in this case, it's this magnet right here. This is your stator. So normally we don't use magnets. We uh, we prefer to use inductances to create a an ele uh, magnetic field that will supply the rotation or that will move the motor to its uh, steady state speed or its rotation. 
The rotor is the moving part and basically you let current flow through the motor like this and with this current uh, torque is induced and this uh, element right here will spin okay so um, there are different windings in a machine an armature winding is where the voltage is induced so you have your rotation the field provides the magnetic field of uh, your stator and uh, some other windings would be interpol and compensating windings so i uh, will only look at these two for the scope of tripoli 3 okay so you have a dc machine looks like this in uh its simplified diagram so uh these dots and x's right here correspond to the winding so when we think of a dot we see a we actually see a uh, wire moving out so and for here the wire is going in here the wire is moving out the wire is moving out going in here and so on and so forth so basically it represents an inductance because of different loops all right and you and this loop provides a magnetic field on the rotor inside which has a connection of connection of uh, wires here. The, the, the wire here is going out, the wire here is going in, etc. etc. Right. So what's inside is your armature winding and uh, the uh, wires outside is your compensating uh, winding. okay? So and uh, these are your poles. Here you go. So this is a two pole DC machine. These are your poles. okay? And these are the interpole windings. And now we have the field windings right here. The field windings create a uh, basically a magnetic field inside this uh, inside the machine to make the rotor rotate. So it could be a shunt field, it could be a series field. We'll define that as we go along the lecture. All right. So now let's look at DC machines. Uh, basically, the uh, circuit equivalent of a DC machine looks like this. So this part should look familiar. All right. So what is it? It's actually your Thevenin equivalent. Okay. So something as uh, complicated as your DC machine. So as you can see earlier, there's a lot of wires coiled together. It can actually be represented as a Thevenin circuit. Right, so this is your Thevenin equivalent of that DC machine. It has an armature resistance, the Thevenin resistance, and what we call this the developed, uh, excuse me, the developed voltage or the back EMF. Okay, so this is generated due to the spin of your machine. Okay, if your machine is spinning, it develops a counter voltage. Okay. So it develops a counter voltage and uh, basically it kind of feeds back that voltage to the terminals A1 and A2. All right. So um, this is the electrical side of your DC machine. Your mechanical side is this. The torque generated by the uh, electric current is represented as uh, counterclockwise along with the generated uh, rotation okay the mechanical side is uh, clockwise All right so the torque from the mechanical side is clockwise so if it's a motor it could be some load okay so you load you load something on the motor and uh, if it's a generator it could be your prime mover so if it's a if you're using a generator then the net uh, spin is this all right so uh, this is your armature winding okay the field winding it could be a separate uh, entity okay uh, basically uh, this current right here creates the magnetic field that you saw here earlier okay so this could be uh, this actually defines that magnetic field and this resistance is due to the amount of coils so as you have more wires, you have more you have a larger resistance, and uh, it's a consequence of having many coils actually. So this is your field resistance, as we call it. Okay. 
So uh, there are different types of DC machines. So we're connecting them in different ways. We have four types actually. Your separately excited, self-excited, self, -excited, self uh, shunt, and self-excited series, and finally your compound DC machine. So for this course, uh, we're only going to look at separately excited and self-excited DC machines. Specifically, the shunt field self-excited DC machine. Okay. So for the separately excited, your armature and field windings have different sources of excitation. What does that mean? The connection for your armature winding has is uh, separate from the connection of your field winding. That means you need to power both separately using different DC sources. All right. Uh, Self-excited shunt field, by the word shunt, it means the field winding is connected in parallel with the armature. Okay. So we'll only consider this. All right. So your separately excited generator. Okay, so this is a generator. Basically, it has a prime mover. So a torque is uh, being inputted, or is it a word? No, uh, the torque, uh, a mechanical torque is the input to the system, and this mechanical torque generates electricity to a certain uh, load resistance. Okay, so uh, without your field winding, so the field winding creates your magnetic field when this spins induces it induces a voltage. So this is your back EMF, and this voltage powers this our load right here. Okay. So let's look at each of the component. All right. Your EG, your generated EMF, is actually the result of the spin of your generator, the field current, and some inductance. So this is the mutual inductance, the, sorry, the mutual inductance between your armature and your field. So this is actually what we call uh, mutual inductance or the coupling factor between your armature and the field, okay? So, uh, if you do KVL in this loop, right here, the uh, relationship between your EG, your generated voltage, and what we call VT, or the terminal voltage, is equal to this equation right here. It's just from KVL in this loop, okay? So, for VF is equal to RFIF. This is your field voltage, your field resistance, and your field current. It's also... Just do uh, it's just the KVL equation in this loop. Okay. So the electrical torque in this case, oops, sorry. The electrical torque in this case is equal to your armature, your uh, coupling between your armature and field or the inductance times the field current times the armature current right here. So basically, your uh, your um, generated electrical torque is dependent on your armature current and field current okay so that means if there is no load so let's observe this if our load is equal to infinity so that means this is open your uh, armature current is zero therefore there is no generated uh, counter torque here in the motor if we increase the load basically we put a uh, finite resistance here then that means there is some resistance in the mechanical side that means it's kind of harder to make the motor spin and you actually kind of observe this when you are uh, when you have your flashlight that you're cranking so the flashlight that can be charged by uh, just pumping or just making the motor spin if you take out the light if you disconnect the light from the motor, then spinning that, uh, the spinning the motor using your hands is actually easier than with than if the light is connected. So that means if the light is disconnected, there is no counter torque of uh, generated due to the current that is um, due to the armature current that results in this uh, connection right here. Okay. So finally, the mechanical torque is equal to this. So where did this equation come from? It's just your force balance equation. Basically, when uh, we have a, a static condition, what does that mean? There is no net torque. This is the sum of torque equal to zero. So uh, the torque generated from your machine, or sorry, the torque that is input, that is the input to your machine, is equal to your uh, output torque and some damping factor multiplied by the speed that the motor is running. Okay. 
So, separately excited uh, DC motor. Okay. So, for the separately excited DC motor, uh, what changed here is that the direction of currents are now different. And instead of in a load resistance, you now have a source voltage that is powering the motor to create a spin. Okay. So, again, the relationship between your... Uh, IA and IF is still the same with is still uh, the same as your uh, generator right here. So uh, you ignore this. This is for a generator. The spin of the motor in this case is counterclockwise since the uh, voltage source is powering the uh, system. Okay. So the generated voltage here or the back EMF is still equal to the amount of spin times the coupling factor times the field current. This equation is just KVL. Okay? So it's KVL in this loop and uh, it just, since uh, we have a different direction of currents, then the VT and EG are flipped. So as compared to the previous slide. Here it's still the same. So it's still uh, just KVL in this loop. The electrical uh, torque, the same. So it's kind of, uh, I can think of it La FIFA. So you can, uh, La FIFA. You can think of it that way so you can uh, remember what is the equation for the uh, electrical torque generated. Okay. And finally, this uh, equation right here is just your force balance equation. But uh, just note that you need to flip signs. Oh, sorry, flip the uh, subscripts. Okay, so that, that's a typo right there. All right, so for the uh, self-excited generator, basically you now connect the field windings in parallel to your armature winding. So here it's separate, now here it's parallel. So uh, the field current is equal to your uh, armature current uh, plus, sorry, the field current plus the line current, as we call it, IL, is equal to your armature current. Where did that come from? Well, you just do KCL on this node right here. So it's this equation. Okay. So other equations won't, it actually uh, doesn't change that much. All right. Except for the field, uh, field, excuse me, except for the field uh, equation. Okay. So if you take the KVL at this loop, you'll get this equation right here. So the field resistance has a voltage VT, which is also the terminal voltage. So the field current can be solved by dividing the terminal voltage divided by the armature resistance. Okay. So other equations, still the same right here. So what changed here actually is just your uh, electrical equations. Your mechanical equations remain the same. Same is true with the motor, except that the direction of the current is now different. So the electrical uh, equations will also change. So I leave that to you for you to uh, uh, work work on. Okay, so you can work on the derivations from here. So yeah, All right. So it were, when when we look at energy conversion between your mechanical side and energy side, we're interested with how efficient your uh, motor or your machine in general, converts the energy. Now for a motor first, you have an input power right here. This is the uh, total input power. Some of it goes to electrical losses. Where does these electrical losses come from? Well, uh, reminder that you have a resistance, armature resistance and field resistance. This is because the inductances or the wires that you use for looping actually has a finite resistance. It's a sorry, non-zero resistance. Therefore, there will be losses due to power dissipated by those resistances. So, when you reduce the input power with the electrical losses, the converted power will be left. So that is equal to EGIA. So where did that come from? Well, uh, take note that EG is the developed back EMF on your motor. So what is the power that is being fed to this element right here? This is your uh, motor element. So it's equal to voltage times the current. Okay, so it's consuming EG times IA in this case. So this is your converted power. And some of those 
uh, become mechanical losses and core losses. So this is the loss due to the rotation of your machine. And finally, we account some stray losses to our machine and um, what is left is the output power. Okay. So now let's look at the generator. There's an input power that comes from the prime mover. So it's rotating the machine. So we'll, uh, basically, it's just the opposite of your uh, power flow in your motor. Where you take out the stray losses, there's mechanical losses, core losses. So these are the loss due to rotation. And uh, after that, you get your converted power. So it's still EGIA. So it's in this case, it becomes power supplied by the motor. So why is that? Uh, your, uh, your generator basically powers up electrons, sorry, uh, the current and boosts its potential from negative to positive. So the current flow is like this, okay? So that's why it's developed power or con uh, converted power. And then uh, reduce the electrical losses, you have your output power at the terminals. Okay, so electrical losses again come from the non-zero resistance of your armature and your field windings. Okay. So uh, there is, uh, in motors, there is actually a uh, we will consider if there is uh, saturation, as we call it. So what does that mean? It means that there's too much uh, magnetic field that the, the motor core cannot handle it. So instead of having a, uh, a linear relationship for your field resistance, it becomes distorted at some point. So this is your saturation condition. And in this case, the analysis becomes uh, much more complicated and we'll, we won't actually be dealing with that. So if we neglect the saturation, we're just going to deal with circuits. All right. So you're just going to use these circuits for your analysis. Okay. So just to summarize the terminologies. All right. So I've already introduced to you your armature resistance, internal generated voltage, terminal voltage, field current, armature current, and line current, and your field resistance. LAF is the mutual inductance or the coupling between your armature and field windings. P in is the input power, electrical. Okay. P mech in is the input mechanical power. Your converted power or developed power is P con or P get P dev. Output power is P out. Your TE, TM, and D already shown you this. TE is your electrical torque. TM is the mechanical torque. D is your damping coefficient. All right. So now let's look at uh, the ratings. So some sample ratings for motors is shown here. Okay. So it is indicated if it's separately excited or uh, self-excited. This is the rated output power of the motor. And with this, in this power, the speed is given. All right. So in, in this power, you're uh, powering the armature at 495 volts and at the condition that your excitation is powered by 300 volts. All right. So this is actually what we call the full load condition of your motor. Okay. So this is the full load condition of your motor. Then basically, your uh, separately excited DC motor looks like this diagram right here. So uh, it has a 495 volt uh, voltage source connected to the armature winding. Okay, so it's something like this diagram right here: 495 volts, your uh, armature resistance, and a generated back EMF. Okay, so something like this. All right, so this generated back EMF has or consumes a power of 12.5 kilowatts and generates a speed of 1,500 rounds per minute. And separately, you have your field winding powered by a 300 volt source. All right. Okay, so this is your full load condition. For a generator, it's something like this. Your generator can produce 1.2 kilowatts at this rated speed. Okay. And with uh, 1.2 kilowatts of output, so where where does that uh, where can that be seen? So if this is your mo your generator, so something like this. Oops, oh, can't draw there. So 
your generator with this diagram looks like this. And the output power is measured at the terminals right here. So it's connected to a full load condition. So it means it's connect. Uh, that means it co it's connected to a resistance. Okay. So and this VT is consuming 1.2 or uh, 1.2 kilowatts of energy. Okay. Or power. All right. So uh, these ratings right here would be your um, output voltage. So this. 220 volts at the rotor. That means it's the armature voltage or the terminal voltage. And finally, your excitation is 220 volts. Since if we uh, since this is separately excited, then it's powered separately by a 220 volt voltage source. All right. Okay. So again, uh, this is your full load condition. When you look at the rate, uh, ratings of your generator or motor, you always assume that this is the full load condition. Okay. So with this, we're going to consider the external characteristic curves or what we call the terminal voltage versus line current curves of your uh, DC motor or generator. Okay. So this plot actually shows us the behavior of your motor or generator based on the load that it uh, that it is supplying okay or receiving all right so if we uh, look at the, the relationship so the, the there are two types of curves here the separately excited curve and your self excited motor curve so what does this mean il is the line current if you increase il you increase the load of your motor or generator so what happens is that your VT or your terminal voltage as is actually decreasing as you increase your load. At some point, it could become zero, but you could have exceeded your full load uh, condition for uh, for that uh, in that case. All right. So we now define what we call the voltage regulation, which is this equation right here. Voltage at no load that means IL is zero. So the voltage at this condition. Minus the voltage at full load, which you'll see in the motor or generator ratings, divided by the total voltage in the full load times 100. So this is your voltage regulation in percent. All right. So you can actually pause the video in this case uh, if you're already if you're already uh, saturated with information. So you can uh, get some break at this point, but uh, the video will still continue. Okay, so, so for the next part, we're going to uh, do circuit analysis with DC machines. So for the first example, it's this. So we have a given motor. So given its full load condition right here. And we find these uh, values, which are actually already shown right here. Okay, so how do you solve these values? All right, so first you need to visualize the circuit that you are uh, solving, okay? In this case, it's a self-excited DC motor. So since it's self-excited, we assume it's self-excited shunt field. So so it's what does that mean? Your armature winding, which is kind of a Thevenin circuit, and your field winding, which is just a resistance, are connected in parallel with each other, and you connect a voltage source to them, this is now your self-excited DC motor. Okay. So now we want to solve for the line current first. So the line current is IL. Okay. So the motor is running or consuming 10 kilowatts when its terminal voltage is 250 volts. So VT here is does it means that it's 250 volts. So 250 volts. Okay. So you can now solve for the line current here. How? So actually, since the whole motor is consuming 10 kilowatts, this whole motor is consuming 10 kilowatts, then it's kind of like just one element. So I'm going to draw it here. It's just one element that is consuming 10 kilowatts from a power source of 250 volts. So this is now your motor circuit. Okay. So it's equivalent to a resistor that is consuming 10 kilowatts when a 250 volt uh, source is connected. Okay? And basically, since it's 10 kilowatts and uh, it has a voltage, you can solve for the current 
that is passing through this resistor. So you just divide that 10 kilowatts divided by 250 volts. You have your for uh, line uh, uh, line current answer 40 amperes. Okay. So for the uh, field current, well, since we know that this is 250 volts, then the voltage drop from your field resistance is 250 volts. Okay, and the field resistance is given as 50 ohms. Therefore, just divide that 250 volts by, by 50 ohms. Where did you get that? It's Ohm's law. And you get 5 amperes of field current. Okay. Next is the armature current. The armature current is uh, can be solved by KCL at this node right here. So there's 40 amperes. That's their line current. There's uh, 5 amperes, your field current. Therefore, what is left here is 40 minus 35. You have... Uh, sorry, 40 minus 5, you have 35 amperes of armature current here. That's passing, that that, uh, that is uh, flowing through your armature winding. And finally, the internal generated voltage can be solved by doing KVL in this loop right here. So KVL on this loop. So there's a current passing through this armature resistor. Therefore, if, th if it's this direction, then the polarity looks something like this. The polarity of your uh, back EMF EG is fixed, so that's EG. And uh, the polarity when you pass through your terminals VT is from negative to positive, therefore in KCL that's positive. So you'll get this equation right here and you get your internal generated voltage of 246.5 volts. Finally, the electrical losses are defined by the resistances and the loss that is uh, dissipated by these resistors it's equal to I squared R, the current passing through them squared times their resistance. So this came from the fact that power is equal to voltage times current and voltage is equal to current times resistance. So something like that. So if you simplify this expression, you get P is equal to I squared R. Okay, there you go. All right. So uh, next, we have the second example. All right, so uh, there you go. All right, so a separately excited DC generator has a no load terminal voltage of 125 volts when driven at 1,800 RPM with the field current set to 10 amperes. Neglecting saturation, that means we can an analyze it uh, simply. Find, uh, well, has three parts okay first you need to draw that it's a separately excited DC generator that means that the uh, generator would just look like a Thevenin equivalent circuit like this there you go so the no load condition what does that mean this is open okay so it has a terminal voltage and the no load condition is given that it has a voltage of 125 volts if it's open. What does that mean? Then there is no current passing through this resistor. And that means that the generated EMF or the generated voltage across the motor is 125 volts. And it's spinning at a rate of 1,800 RPM in this condition that there is no load at 10 amperes of your field current. So the question here is, what is the generated voltage if the IF is constant at 10 amperes and your motor is now spinning at 1,600 RPM? Well, actually, the formula can be found way back in the slides I'll show you. So the formula is this. There you go. Let me just clear. There you go. So uh, the back EMF is directly proportional to omega M and IF. Okay. So since LAF is constant, we won't worry about that. All right. So there are two conditions here. We have EG1 that is equal to 125 volts at an IF. IF1 of 10 amperes and a speed omega m1 equal to 1800 rpm okay 
So now we're, uh, the uh, the the problem is asking for the problem is asking for the generated voltage EG two at these conditions right here. So EG two is unknown. Um, IF two is still ten amperes, and you have your uh, speed of rotation equal to 1,600 RPM. There you go. So knowing that the relationship between your generated voltage and your field current and your uh, speed of rotation is this equation. So LAF is constant. Therefore, this equation, EG divided by Omega M I F is always constant. Therefore, we have this condition right here. So you just write the equation. Is equal to the same equation, but uh, we let it be. We'll just change the subscript to two. So that's the second condition. So now we have here the given IF2, the omega M2, EG1, IF1, and omega M1. We can solve for EG2 in this case. Okay. So that is equal to. There you go. There you go. Times EG1. And that is equal to, let's use a calculator here. So um, uh, IF2 is equal to 1,600 RPM. Sorry, IF2 is 10 amperes. Omega M2 is 1,600 RPM divided by the quantity 1,800 RPM times 10 amperes. So we have this, multiply it to EG1, which is 125. We have 111.11 .11 volts. And that is the answer listed here. Next, the speed in RPM so that we have EG is 100 volts and IF is still constant at 10 amperes. So again, we'll just use uh, this equation right here, a condition that LAF is constant. Okay. So here. But we're now finding the speed in RPM. So we're looking for omega M2. Okay, so that means we just isolate omega M2. Alright, so cross multiply this to this equation and these to this equation. So it becomes something like this. So multiplied by... Times we have omega m1. There you go. So just uh, plug it, plug that into the equation. Your uh, hundred over hundred twenty-five times ten over ten. That's just one times your speed in uh, which is one thousand eight hundred rpm. There you go. So that means it's 1,400 RPM, okay. 1,440, sorry. So that speed will yield a generated voltage of 100 volts. And that's the answer right here. So next is, uh, what is the generated, sorry, generated uh, voltage if the speed and IF are increased to 1850 RPM and 12 amperes respectively. Okay. So again, we'll just use this uh, ratio and proportion equation here. So, uh, sorry, we'll use this. Generated voltage if the conditions change. All right. So, 1850 RPM and 12 amperes respectively. All right. So, we'll just input that to your calculator. Where is it again? There you go. So, that's uh, 1850 times, uh, where is it again? 1850 times 12 amperes divided by 
the initial condition 1800 rpm times 10 amperes multiply that with the original voltage it's 154.1667 or simply 154 volts right here okay so for example 3 i'll leave it i'll leave it to you as an exercise so these are the answers you can solve it by yourself by yourselves okay so now let's look at the case of starting a dc motor when we were solving our uh equations earlier, or problems, or the examples earlier, we're assuming that the motor is already at its steady state value. That means it has a constant speed, or it's not accelerating at all. Okay, at the starting condition, actually, of course, the motor is, or the generator is stopped, which means that your uh, generated voltage is zero. So if we connect a voltage source here for a motor, if we connect a voltage source here, then the amount of current that will flow through this line current right here would be very large since this is zero. And your armature winding could actually be fried because of that. So RA tends to be very small actually. And that means your armature current can be quite large which could damage your armature winding. So at the starting condition, this, this, uh, this looks like well, this is what will it look like okay so if you connect a voltage source your current will surge okay and then drop down as the motor is gaining speed okay so if we have a current limiting condition your uh, steady state could uh, your, your maximum current would be decreased and you can reach the steady state value at the same time okay so we use a technique to uh, limit the starting current, we connect a series of resistances to your armature uh, armature winding, okay? And then as the motor starts, you just f uh, flip the switch to short them out like this, okay? To prevent the surge of current that is uh, going through your armature winding. Or you can have what we call an uh, heuristic uh, resistance that could control the field winding so as not to uh, let the current flow here surge. Okay? Sorry, rheostat. It's called rheostat. Uh, not, uh, that's a different term. Okay, so it's rheostat resistance. So first set to zero so you can have the maximum torque. Okay, so this is a method to limit the armature current that passes through the motor. Okay. So the starting sequence is that uh, first the switch SF is closed. This is closed to generate your field uh, wind, uh, field uh, to generate your magnetic field in the field resistance or the field winding. Next is the switch SA is closed. Sorry, here, and then you let the current flow through these resistances. Once your current uh, your uh, motor uh, is spinning. Uh, it's the, it does not increase its speed anymore. You close the switch again and again and again until you basically uh, build it up. Okay, so close the switches in sequence and then the rheostat is increased until the motor rotates at the desired speed. So this is your motor control uh, setup. Okay, so the current looks like this. Okay, speed increases, but your armature current is just. Uh, it does not surge like what you saw earlier. Okay. So next example. Okay. Consider a five horsepower, 125 volt, 1,200 RPM, blah 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 blah, self-excited DC motor. Okay. So given the armature and field resistances, and has an efficiency of 85% at full load. Okay. So determine the external resistance to be connected in series with the armature of the motor. But to limit the armature current at startup to twice its full load value. Okay. So this is a motor given with this. So horse 5 horsepower. So first it's self-excited. You draw the you draw the uh, schematic first. So self-excited, then your armature winding is connected in parallel. Like this. And this is your motor. 
All right. So this is your field resistance, your armature resistance, and your input right here. Okay. So the full load has uh, an efficiency of 85%. Okay. So the output here is that uh, the motor is spinning. Okay. At a uh, power of uh, five. Sorry, five horsepower. And it has a terminal voltage of 125 volts here. Okay. And the speed at this lo uh, full load condition is 1,200 rotations per minute. Okay. So the armature resistance is 0 0.2 ohms. And the field resistance is 62.5 ohms all right so what is the external resistance that will be connected in series so we'll connect a resistance here at the armature winding so that at start up that means the pack emf is zero here eg is zero your uh, current is limited to uh, twice its full load value so first, we need to determine what is the full load value of the armature current. Excuse me. So since it has a uh, five horsepower of uh, rotation generated, so it, this is the output power basically at the motor, and the efficiency is eighty-five percent at full load. So first, what is efficiency? Efficiency is equal to the output power divided by the input power. Or basically, it's output power divided by the output plus the power the power losses, or basically, it's the the numerator becomes p in the input power minus the power loss, the total power loss divided by the, the total input power. Okay, so where does these losses come from? We have electrical losses, core losses, mechanical losses, and other stray losses. Okay. So electrical losses could be due to your copper loss, your uh, the resistance of your armature in your field, or it could be the brush loss, the commutator brush losses. Your core losses is the effect of your uh, inductance core in your motor. Mechanical losses would be uh, friction, the damping. When your motor rotates, there is a damping constant that prevents it to accelerate to in accelerating to infinity. Etc. Uh, Etc. Et Stray losses could be your leakage and armature reaction fluxes. So assumed one percent of uh, of output for machines, 200 horsepower or above. Otherwise, it's neglected. Okay. So recall that these are actually your power losses, uh, your power flow diagram for your motor. This is for your generator. All right. So let's go back here first. So, for example, for we have 5 horsepower of output running at 85% efficiency. Okay? So, if this is the output power, then eta is equal to 5 horsepower divided by your input power. So, your input power came from this uh, voltage right here. So, some voltage source. Okay. So... Basically, your input power is equal to the output power, which is 5 horsepowers, divided by the efficiency eta. So, 5 horsepower, you need to convert that to, uh, to watts first. So, the conversion factor is that uh, 1 horsepower is equal to 746 watts. So if you want to confirm that, let's look at uh, let's look at the internet for confirmation. Okay, so one HP two watts. So it's seven hundred forty-six or seven hundred forty-five point seven. So let's just use seven hundred forty-six. Okay. So that means that five horsepower is equal to. Whoops. There you go. 3,730 watts or 3.73 kilowatts. Okay. So that means the input power is equal to your output power 
divided by eta okay so divided by 0 0.85 the input power is equal to 4388 sorry 4.388 kilowatts there you go so that means in this circuit right here you have 4.388 kilowatts of power then you can solve for the line current that is going inside this uh, motor right here okay so the line current is equal to since power is equal to voltage times your current then your current can be solved by this equation and you divide that by the voltage is 125. That's 35.106. Okay. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Uh, amperes. There you go. Next, you can, you can now solve for the armature current by doing KCL at this loop. So, you have your IL going inside. You have your uh, armature resistance and armature uh, sorry field resistance so the armature the field uh, current if can be solved by doing ohm's law here since the uh, voltage is 125 volts then the current can be solved at our at the field resistance so something like this which is equal to 2 amperes and finally, we can solve for the armature current, which is equal to the line current minus the field current, which is equal to 33.106 amperes. Okay, so this is your full load current. So twice the full load current is equal to 66.212 amperes. And we want to limit our... Um, starting current to that so what should be the uh, series resistance to ra here so that the current is limited to 66.12 amperes so knowing that we have 125 volts passing through the whole motor and assuming we are starting condition at starting condition your back emf eg is zero so this is zero so let me just clean that All right so you can so the starting cur at the start of your uh, motor the equivalent circuit looks like this so your motor is still shorted so this is zero volts and this is your armature uh, armature resistance and some series resistance that we intend to solve Okay, so uh, we limit the armature current at starting condition to, to twice the full load current here. Then we can solve for R by KVL in this loop right here. So by KVL, that's 125 minus IA, the, the armature current, times the sum of the resistances here equal to zero quite simply sorry uh, it should this should be twice your armature current so there you go you can now solve for R in this case there you go so you can now solve for R R would be okay minus zero point two. There you go, one point six eight seven ohms, which is well something like this, All right? Okay. So the uh, example number five, again, I'll leave it to you. So the answer is right here. So you can do it as an exercise 
to practice before you take the quiz when we will meet for this topic. Okay. Okay. So also example number six, I'll leave it again to you. All right. So the next part we have batteries and cells. So this is the last part of the lecture. So a cell is an electrochemical device which converts your electrical energy to chemical energy or vice versa. Okay. So for the chargeable uh, things, you have your electro or your electrochemical conversion. Okay, so your battery is an assembly of two or more cells, electrically connected as a single enclosed unit. So when you think of batteries, you sometimes think of how many cells does it contain. Okay. So your uh, laptop battery could, con could be 8 cell, could be 16 cell or whatnot. So it depends on your manufacturer. Okay. So that's just the difference between them actually. Right, so a charged battery, so we can think of it like uh, this. So this pyramid right here shows the relationship kind of between your uh, electrical energy and your chemical energy. So for a charged battery, the reactants are available and the battery has accumulated, not accumulated or stored a net electrical charge. Okay, if the battery is just discharging, then the uh, chemicals are being accumulated okay and being converted to a form which cannot or which does not store charge at all anymore okay the equivalent circuit of a battery is just well this should look familiar again even a battery can be represented by a voltage source in series with uh, with a uh, uh, resistance so this is kind of your Thevenin equivalent. Okay. So this resistance is actually the internal resistance and this uh, uh, voltage here is the internal voltage of the battery. So finally, the output voltage is represented by this E cell right here. So E cell is a terminal voltage. E int is the EMF developed because of the redox reaction inside the electric cell. And an internal resistance would account for the losses inside the battery. Okay. So uh, your ideal battery should look like this. It, has, it should have a constant voltage as it discharges. And at 100% discharge, then the voltage just ideally just drops to a unacceptable value. But a real battery starts at a high voltage and as it discharges then it the voltage is decreased at a certain rate okay and at discharge then it is uh, at a very low voltage value all right so for batteries the terminal voltage is dependent on the resistance of the material your electrode losses, so so we have different losses here, activation over voltage, concentration over voltage. Okay. Uh, the area of the electrode can is also a factor. And uh, half the uh, reaction potentials, concentration of reactants or the number of moles, and the uh, pressure and temperature of uh, the environment of the battery. So, yeah. So this is the end of, lec of this lecture. And this is the end of the coverage of your first exam. So please get ready for an exam after this uh, meeting. Right, so I'll announce anyway when we'll have our exam. So the exam is only during class time. So you don't need to worry about scheduling. And I'll see you when I see you.